So I'm going to speak to you this morning about compassion, courage and obedience. Uh, last week, Dish and Simon did a great presentation about Jesus healing the blind man. And the, the weeks that have gone by in the past, we've been talking about how Jesus went from having quite a private ministry where the miracles he performed, he told people not to tell anyone about. Think about the lepers. He said, don't talk to anyone. Go and see the priests. Or you think about another blind man that he healed. He said, don't tell anyone. But then in the last few weeks, we've been sharing about the more public miracles that Jesus did. And the reason there was a shift was because he knew he was determined he would be crucified on the Passover and that now is the time for going public. So what I'm going to share is another one of Jesus's very public testimonies, public healings. Sorry, I was completely distracted by a new baby. <laughs> We'll be all right as long as no more new babies arrive. (laughs) Isn't God good, eh? Oh, I've got a story, a testimony of a new baby, which is amazing. So, about 18 months ago, we prayed for an Indian pastor, the pastor that Andy went to visit when he did the trip last year. And we prayed for his wife because she'd had an ectopic pregnancy and they'd removed a fallopian tube and it was very painful and heartbreaking for them. So we we and lots of other people prayed for them. Anyway, a few months after that, they sent us two x-rays. One was of her with one fallopian tube and the other one was of her with two fallopian tubes. And they both look completely different, which I thought was hilarious. And what God had done is he'd completely, supernaturally given her a new fallopian tube. I'm happy to report that Blessy gave birth to a little baby son this week. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? Um, uh, It's amazing. I love the fact that one of the fallopian tubes was a bit like a corkscrew. It looked like someone had gone wild with creativity. And I was like, I bet a ton of money that that is the one that was replaced. (laughs) So fun. God's so good, isn't he? Oh, that's three of us that think God's good. Uh, God is so good. Here's a couple that had difficulty conceiving, then her chances got reduced to 50% of conceiving. So what did God do? God replaced the fallopian tube and gave her a baby boy. He's good, isn't he? So um, I'm going to chat to you today and I'm going to share about Jesus' masterclass in compassion, courage and obedience. We could spend weeks studying this because there's so much in it, and I'm going to try and do it in 20 minutes. (laughs) Lord, help me. (laughs) Yeah, Jesus, I just pray the things that you showed me in that split second where you just opened my eyes to this passage in a fresh way, I pray that you would do that this morning, that we would see you in even more fullness and glory than we have done up to this point. Jesus, you're amazing. You are so amazing. And if I can communicate that, I will be well pleased. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, Empathy. I thought, what's the difference between empathy and compassion? So Google says, empathy is feeling another's pain, whereas compassion is taking action to relieve the suffering of others. 1 Peter 3 says, finally, all of you be like-minded, be compassionate, loving as brothers, tender-hearted and courteous. So I'm going to talk to you because what I saw a while back when I was reading this passage was the amazing compassion of Jesus. How he was just full of incredible compassion and how that was the con that was the conduit, the pathway, the key to him ministering so powerfully 
was this compassion that meant he connected with people in a supernatural way. I also want you to know, if you're wired like me, that I was aware, talking about Lazarus and his death and resurrection, that we have got dearly loved friends with us who have prayed for their husbands or their fathers to be healed, and it didn't happen. And they prayed for resurrection, and that didn't happen. And I just want to say that, let you know, first of all, I phoned them up to tell them what I was speaking on, so they would know, because I wouldn't want to upset them, and I know it can be very painful. But I also want you to know that their response was amazing. Every one of them said, go and preach it. Every one of them said, I'm going to pray for you that it goes really well. And every one of them was behind me 100% sharing this. But I do want to lift them up because they are giants in faith. They face things we haven't had to face yet. And every one of us will face death at some point in our lives. Or perhaps a few times in our lives if we're like Paul. And then we'll, you know, overcome it a few times. But I just wanted to reassure anyone that I've spoken to them. But also to lift up them and their families as giants of faith. And that we need to honour them. Okay. Is that okay? Now I'm going to read from you from John 11. Now a certain man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village where Mary and her sister Martha lived. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him and said, Lord, he is, your bro- he is our brother, your friend, and you love him and he's sick. And when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death. But, on the contrary, it's for the glory and honour of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, Jesus loved and was concerned about Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and he considered them dear, dear friends. So when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed in the same place for two more days. (laughs) What? Jesus stayed in the same place for two more days. Then two days later, Jesus says to the disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. The disciples, who I always find so encouraging because they're so gormless about everything, which I feel great affinity to, to be honest. The disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. However, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was referring to natural sleep. So when Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, because now you have another opportunity to see who I am so that you will learn to trust in me. Come, let's go to see him. Jesus acted completely contrary to what you'd expect. Jesus didn't respond at all how I thought he would. He already knew Lazarus had died, but he remained where he was. Why? We know he loved Lazarus, Mary and Martha, so why didn't he go? Jesus remained where he was for another three days. Why? Because Jesus could see that there was a bigger purpose behind Lazarus dying. He said, this sickness will not end in death. On the contrary, it's the glory and honour of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Okay, so it was good for the disciples that Jesus didn't pray for Lazarus. And actually, the Jesus was going to be glorified by it. And it was also going to help them learn to trust Jesus more. Okay. Fast forward verse 20. Jesus and the disciples are coming and they meet Martha away from the town 
Because at this point, there's loads of people in Judea that want to kill Jesus. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary was still in the house. Martha, I love this about Martha. Martha's known for being too busy. But here we see that Martha was actually a great woman of faith. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know, he will rise again on the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet he will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. That's amazing testimony, isn't it? When you've just buried your brother. Amazing faith. And we've got people amongst us who've got amazing faith too. Then Mary comes to see Jesus. When Jesus looked at Mary and saw her at his feet, and he saw her friends grieving, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. In the Passion Translation, it says he shuddered with emotion, was deeply moved and trembled with tenderness and compassion. And he said, where have you laid him? Then Jesus, the disciples, Mary, Martha, and all the people that were following Mary go to the tomb. And Jesus stood there and wept. And it wasn't polite kind of polite tears where it's like just trickling down your face silently. In one of the translations it says it was, you could, it was loud sobs and deep crying. Then Jesus, deeply moved with intense emotion, came to the tomb. So Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead five days earlier. So why did he cry? I'm going to tell you what would have happened if Teresa had been there instead of Jesus. <laughs> Teresa would have walked up with her disciples, which would probably have been like one person. <laughs> She'd have walked up, she'd have said to Martha, don't worry, pet, it's going to be all right. Then she'd have gone over to Mary and said, it's going to be okay. Then she'd have walked straight to the tomb and said, Lazarus, come out. She would have completely missed all the important things that Jesus did. It's incredible. Jesus knew five days earlier he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew it. He was, knew it so much that he stayed where he was deliberately so that Lazarus would be dead for four days. And I'll explain to you a bit later why that is. Jesus is very, very, very different to Teresa. Jesus, we see in this passage that he was full of compassion and he validated, loved and comforted the sisters. Despite the terrible pain and grief and suffering they were going through, Jesus ministered to them first. He took time to talk to Martha and he took time to make sure he saw Mary. He called for Mary to come to him. He was asking that she would come and see him because he wanted to minister to her and to comfort her. Jesus is full, absolutely ram jam full of compassion. He is full of compassion. What is Jesus full of? Sorry, I didn't hear you. What is Jesus full of? He's 
full of compassion. We also see here that Jesus was not afraid of strong emotions. Jesus isn't Scottish, he isn't British, he isn't even European. He got really upset at what had happened to Lazarus and to Mary and to Martha. Jesus wasn't so consumed with the miracle that he knew he was going to do that he ignored the human suffering that was before him. He joined Martha and Mary in their suffering and comforted them first before he did the miracle. I'm sharing this with you because I think this is how Jesus wants us to operate. And I think on media sometimes we see ways of healing people that are not like this. But I want to minister to people in the fullness of Christ with all aspects of his character on display. And this is how Jesus ministered. Jesus was also deter was determined to obliterate the enemy's authority to steal, kill, and destroy humanity's lives. This really struck me because when I'm praying or listening to people and I'm sitting with them, I can get wrapped up in their suffering and the story and I can lose the courage then to pray for them. But Jesus managed to do both. It's almost like a colossus. One leg of Jesus is compassion and the other one is obedience to what Daddy God's calling him to do. And he stands on both pillars and that's what he wants us to do. When he got to the tomb, there's a phrase in one of the translations, it said he was full of emotional indignation and sternness. He was angry at the sorrow caused by death. He was determined, um, oh, come to the next point. So I want to share with you about his courage. Jesus wasn't angry with the mourners, but he was angry at the work of the thief taking the life of his friend before it should have gone. This was just before, days before, Jesus was planning to allow them to crucify him. Was one of the reasons he was so upset and angry and emotional was because after 33 years of being on the planet, He'd had enough of seeing how the enemy could steal, kill, and destroy people's lives. Was the reason he was so upset was because he was determined that he was going to make sure he went to the cross and paid the price so that the enemy's authority would be completely destroyed and that he would not be free to steal, kill, and destroy humanity anymore. In Luke 10, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. The good shepherd, the good shepherd, the good shepherd. What's Jesus? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And Jesus said, no one takes it from me. No one took Jesus' life from him. He allowed them to crucify him. He allowed them to beat him. He allowed them to punish him. Because he knew that our lives would be transformed by it. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down, I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up. This charge I have received from my father. 
I think one of the reasons Jesus was angry and stern, as well as being compassionate, was because he came to destroy the works of the enemy. And he was determined he was going to completely obliterate him. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. That was uppermost in his thinking. And he wanted to give us eternal life. So we get to the two. Jesus is deeply moved and filled with intense emotion, sternness and anger at the tomb. I don't know what it's like to hear Jesus angry, but I think it's pretty scary. But Jesus stood at the tomb, a stone lay against it, and he said, take away the stone. Martha said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be a terrible smell. He's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? This is another point to us, because I know you're all courageous believers that love Jesus. But there are times with our friends and our family where we need to challenge them if they've forgotten Daddy God's perspective about themselves or about another situation, about somebody else. It's really important that we lovingly correct each other when we are, when one of us has, you know, forgotten God's perspective. And as couples, it's important we do that for each other, that we strengthen each other, that we remind each other of God's perspective on how he sees us, how he sees other people, how he sees his church, how much compassion he has. Because we can be like Jesus to each other then. Did I not tell you, if you believed, you would see the glory of God? They took away the stone, and Jesus lifted his eyes and said, this is so funny. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I say this on account of all the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. I'm sure he said some of those things just for the disciples sometimes. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> just to reassure you guys, Daddy God hears me all the time, but I'm saying it out loud so you know. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! Except it was Jesus. And I think when Jesus said it, there'd probably be rocks shaking and trees swaying and an awful lot of power being present. It'd be one of those times where you kind of hold your breath. I don't know if you do that. Sometimes when God moves in our meetings or in worship, I hold my breath. <laughs> it's because of expectation, I think. What's he going to do next? Then there was, a mira there was miracle upon miracle. Lazarus would have decomposed. So that meant every single cell in his body, every nerve, every muscle, every bone, every sinew, his brain, everything, absolutely everything came back to life. That is phenomenal when you think about it. Oh, someone's come to join me. Lazarus shuffled out and needed unwrapping. Imagine what tales Lazarus would have had. This was a game-changing moment because nobody, the Jews believed that your spirit would hover about for three days. But the fact that Jesus healed someone who'd been dead for four days pointed to the fact that he was the Messiah. It was undoubtable proof that Jesus was the Messiah, the fact that he'd raised Lazarus from the dead. 
this was a game-changing moment because from that point on, the, the authorities, the religious authorities, decided they were going to kill Jesus. What has God spoke to me through this was that actually compassion's like a conduit. See this computer here? I can go anywhere in the world on this computer. I can talk to all sorts of people. I can pray for people. I can do all sorts on this computer. We did it in Zoom. We saw healings. Still are seeing healings on Zoom. We pray for blessing on Zoom. That's like God's... That is a poor, a paltry, terrible representation of the power of God. But you get the idea. But compassion is like this. It means we can deliver the power of God into wherever he wants us plugged in. But we do it with compassion and the same compassion that Jesus had. And it is more powerful because of how we deliver it. I just thought that was a great illustration. God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. So did Jesus achieve his objective? Imagine the Passover feast a few days later. There'd be Lazarus there and Jesus one of the translations said it was held in the home of Simon the leper. So there was a leper there who was not a leper anymore. Just imagine the kids present. They'd be fighting over who to sit next to. I'm going to sit next to Lazarus. Well, I'm going to speak to Simon the leper. Well, I'm going to hang out with Jesus. You can just imagine, can't you? In Revelation 1.17, I love this passage. This is when the Apostle John is having a vision and he meets the resurrected Jesus in all his glory. And Jesus, the first thing Jesus said to him is, don't be afraid. <laughs> I am the first and the last, the absolute deity, the Son of God and the ever-living one. I died, but see, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of absolute control and victory over death and Hades. That's the realm of the dead. This means that anyone who died before Jesus, or anyone who died after Jesus, he has got complete control and victory over death. He is Lord over the realm of the dead. And we have eternal life. Even our friends that got promoted before we did, they've enjoyed a whole, they are more whole and more themselves than they ever were on this planet. And they've got to see what heaven is like firsthand. And what I wanted to really encourage you was just the sheer overwhelming compassion of Jesus in a dreadful situation. And we see it all through the Gospels, his compassion to people. And just to encourage us to continue being compassionate, just like him. <laughs>